All right, hello, my listeners. Welcome back to Zillow Seven Says. This is your co-host Eric Osborne. I am preparing this intro for you today for the episode with Susan. Oh, Susan. I suspect that my intro may become an entire episode. <laughs> so if that's the case, stick with me and come out the other side. There is value here. There is an important message to communicate here. For me, this is actually a monumental episode. The conversation isn't necessarily earth-shattering. Our guest, um, Susan, isn't a infamous healer or mega-influencer, yet in a multitude of ways, she represents who and what I have both consciously and unconsciously devoted my work to since at least 2009. Looking back, perhaps it's my entire life that's being directed by this force. She also represents a paradigm shift that is underway, one that is certain to alter our relationships with the divine, with ourselves, each other, the planet, and the cosmos considerably. For this reason, if you will allow, I feel it is necessary to provide some context prior to the interview. Now, I know my journey is mine. I cannot speak for anyone else, but I also know that we are a collective and that what affects one of us affects us all. Until recently, I had believed that my experiences surrounding the subject of the divine feminine were mine alone that this awakening that I was undergoing was for me singularly. There is truth there, but that is not the whole truth. For those of you who have been listening for a while, you know of my growing obsession with UFO phenomena. For those new to the show, again, bear with me. There is a method to this madness. After reading the recently released autobiography of Chris Bledsoe, titled UFO of God, one of the most heavenly documented UFO experiencers, a man that has been studied and confirmed by NASA scientists and a slew of other agencies and researchers, uh, what his experiences that in many ways parallel mine communicate is that there is a mother, a divine mother that is watching over us, always there for us when we are in need. Now, male listeners, this does not negate our value. This does not make us less important. The resurgence of the Divine Mother is not a threat. It is a promise, a promise of support, compassion, hope. I don't think at this point there is any way for us to deny that there has been an intentional subjugation of the feminine for millennia. One simply has to look at the history of patriarchal ownership of wives, the execution of so-called witches who were actually healers, all the way through the suffrage movement up to present-day pornographic ubiquity and sex trafficking, among the daily discrimination and objectification that women continue to face. I, too, am, per am guilty of perpetuating misogyny, but that is not all. I am also part of the awakening, and I have attempted in many ways successfully to redeem myself and the masculine. That is why I would like to share more of the details of this journey with you, and particularly how this beautiful human being, Susan Slofter, fits into this puzzle. It is proof positive that you, as simple, as ordinary, as everyday, as you might be, my dear listener, can also be a powerful healer and that this power comes from following your inspiration. As a child, I was inspired to spend more time with females than males. As long as I can remember, I have had a deep abiding love for the feminine. It is where I have felt most comfortable and most at home. I have been in awe of the beauty, the softness, the strength, the power of the feminine. As I grew older, though, this love and adoration became jaded. My mother, who has always been cold and distant, 
certainly due to her upbringing, along with the depictions of women as helpless objects of desire in the media that incessantly assault our senses, could not help but color my perspective. For a regrettably long time, women were to be saved and then to be sexed. That was it. You saved the woman from her innate weakness that was a result of original sin. And then, of course, this means that you own her and therefore get to use her like a sex doll whenever you want. It's embarrassing. It's horrifying beyond words. But any heterosexual man in the United States who says that they have never felt or thought this way, I'm not sure you're being true to yourself. To my male counterparts, please, please, let's forgive ourselves of this sin. If we haven't already, it is the only way that we can move towards healing. We have to acknowledge our sins. We have to forgive ourselves for them. Now, I've been taking psilocybin religiously since 1999. On my very first experience, I fell in love as deeply as I have ever loved any woman with the mushroom. But I could never have imagined then how these mushrooms would lead me to where I am today. And what I'm about to share with you is also illustrative of the intelligence that is at work behind the mushroom and the nonlinear nature of these experiences. In 2009, shortly after I accepted the calling to grow and distribute psilocybin on a large scale, my personal revelation began. One morning, while grinding poo as usual, I had an unexpected visitor. When I first began growing these mushrooms, I did so without much equipment, and I would spend hours upon hours collecting manure from our horses in the field, grinding each turd to a powder by hand, and then all of the other steps that are part of the mushroom growing process. The whole process was and still is beautiful to me. It did then and still does inspire a humbling sense of awe that these magnificent mushrooms grow from the most deplorable of materials, poop. <laughs> I would envision the healing and relief that my clients or customers would get from communing with this sacrament and maintained a conscious reflection of the humble beginnings of each mushroom's life. It is symbolic of our own experience with sacred mushrooms, turning waste to wisdom, from poop to progress. <laughs> and while I don't grind as much poo as I used to, I appreciate the grind of the day-to-day -day and how it impacts our community at Sanctuary and beyond just as much as these buckets of manure. Now, on this day, in particular, while I was grinding poo, I was also preparing mentally for a mushroom trip that same night. It was going to be a solo dose, and I didn't have a particular intention in mind, just exploring. And that's when my visitor arrived. There, hunched over the two five-gallon buckets, one with whole poo and one with a kind of poo powder, I simultaneously stood in the presence of the most beautiful most wise, most powerful woman I had ever seen. She said nothing. She was simply present, looking at me with compassion, forgiveness, and an understanding that allowed every cell in my being to be at once in awe and at ease. I wept. I stood there over that bucket of manure weeping tears of relief, tears of joy, tears of sorrow, tears of courage and hope. And then she was gone. I was alone again. Yet somehow I knew that I had never been alone, and I never would be alone. Slowly my perception returned to normal, a bit stunned and a bit confused, yet totally in love. Well, you know what they say, before enlightenment grind poo, after enlightenment grind poo. So I finished my work and prepared for my mushroom trip that evening, anticipating a wonderful experience after that encounter earlier in the day. I was more than a bit disappointed to find that after two hours from the consumption of these mushrooms, 
there was still no effect. I gave up. Maybe I'd been taking too many mushrooms lately. Maybe there was something wrong with that batch. I didn't know. I relinquished my expectations of a mind-blowing experience and closed my eyes and just laid by the fire. Soon thereafter, she returned. The beautiful woman was still there. She looked at me with the same compassion and understanding. And then she stepped aside and revealed what was behind her. Every single selfish, disrespectful objectification of women, every overstepping of boundaries, every derogatory comment I had ever made, it was all there. I was disgusted with myself, and yet she was still compassionate towards me. The night ended with me falling asleep in a puddle of regretful, shameful tears. My greatest shame was centered around what seemed like an inability to be monogamous. It drove me to suicidal thoughts, the sense that I could never escape this desire and that I would continue to do damage to the women in my life through dishonesty and desire was too much for me to bear. It was often said to me when I would share this internal turmoil with my friends or my then wife that I was simply a sex addict or a womanizer. I internalized this analysis, believing that it was I was intrinsically broken and that taking my life was the only way out. Looking back through my history, I could see that I had always been this way and I was terrified of always being this way. Soon thereafter, my second marriage ended, for the most part due to my attempts to philander. She was also in direct opposition of me starting Silo 7 retreats in Jamaica, uh, but this woman, damaged by unhealed trauma from male dominator culture, would often reinforce negative habits and negative behaviors in myself and this negative relationship with the feminine by encouraging me to watch porn rather than be intimate with her. She would encourage me to have fair affairs without her knowledge. It was for the better, she would say. And despite her directives for me to cheat, she couldn't take it. She would look through my phone, my Facebook, my email, and of course then confront me when she found evidence of me having conversations with other women. It was just too much for both of us. I may have considered myself a womanizer, but I never considered myself a liar. And I was determined that the ending of this marriage would likewise bring an end to the lies. When I met Courtney on our very first date, I had to tell her that monogamy was not for me, and neither was lying. She accepted and agreed that she too felt monogamy was unrealistic, particularly because she was also attracted to women. The fortune at meeting my now wife Courtney, I do not believe to have been random. This Divine Mother, I am confident, brought us together. In the 12 years between the encounter with this mother and today, Courtney and I have been on a challenging journey of discovery and balancing this feminine with masculine energy. In my last few years in Jamaica, I was more suicidal than I had ever been. It's perhaps a miracle that I'm still here, honestly. Much of this was due to these unhealed wounds. My determination to be truthful often led to feelings of deep despair and a sense that I would always be a problem to my wife, who I absolutely adored. Originally, she asked that I just be honest about any other lovers. Attempts at honesty brought up all of the feelings that one might imagine it would for Courtney. Abandonment, unworthiness, unattractiveness, so much more. I saw her cry. I felt her pain. The inescapable nature of my desires could mean only one thing, that I, Eric Osborne, was the problem and that the world would be a much better place without me. I then began to feel that it was going out of the house, seeking relationships apart from ours that was the problem. Courtney was into women. She had female lovers before we met. We could just find a woman to partner with us both and then we could both be happy. I would make this happen for both of us. Well, if you've ever attempted to make someone fall in love with you, then you know that this is an exercise in futility. 
add an additional partner to that and the complications multiply exponentially. You see the imbalance of the masculine in any one of us, male or female, compels us to do, to make, to force, to will things into existence. And within balance, this is healthy, but out of balance, it becomes forceful, imperialistic, overpowering. It neglects the needs of others with sole focus on achieving your desire. There's no allowing in this perspective. There's no openness to spontaneity. Love can't be forced. I had it all wrong. Psilocybin helped my suicidality and depression to an extent. There were journeys that would inform me that my instinctive drive to love two women was natural, a birthright of sorts. But this confidence would quickly fade with my wife's tears. The thousands upon thousands of hours that I spent helping others helped me to an extent. But each week, new people would come and go, and I would be left there seaside in a remote village where I was only to be the helper, never to be the helped. I cannot tell you the number of times that I considered that I visualized myself jumping to my death from the nearby bluff or taking a kayak out beyond the horizon and never returning. Surrounded by helpers, I felt there was no help for me. I could have never known that Susan, a woman who I never knew existed, would be the one to finally help me feel safe and seen. Now, that's not to say that Courtney wasn't helpful. She most certainly was and is. I have never felt as loved and accepted on the daily as I, anyone more than Courtney Rose. But this woman who loved me so deeply was also the woman I was hurting so regularly. So how could she really help me here? Upon moving back to the U.S. from Jamaica, something shifted. My belief is that in returning home, I returned to what remnants of community were still in my life. My drive to create, to bring psilocybin to the world as the first public psilocybin retreat center in the world, compelled me to leave everything and everyone behind, which ultimately left me behind. The container of community, albeit small, upon our return, gave me the space to feel like myself again, to feel what was truly valuable and it provided me with a couple of authentic, caring friends who heard me out fully rather than simply dismissing me as a sex addict or telling me to go get a prostitute. At a certain point, listening to Van Halen, <laughs> not a typical musical, cho musical choice of mine, but uh, somehow Van Halen's song Right Now uh, came on my playlist. And listening to it while driving became a numinous experience. It was as if the skies had parted. I saw with complete clarity that I had been giving my energy over to those who would not reciprocate. That I was spending so much of my time living in an imagined, idealistic future that I was incapable of enjoying right now. It was an almost instantaneous change. I stopped looking for other women to join us. I started appreciating my beautiful, sexy, caring wife for who she was. And for the first time since my childhood, I felt free and joyful in this eternal moment. Our relationship changed drastically. Our intimacy, our conversations, our ability to enjoy our children, our community, and each other expanded magnificently. Almost two years later, without any effort, without any compulsion, simply by allowing the moment, the beautiful moment, to be exactly what it is. On January 1st of 23, a friend of ours of almost two years became our lover. And the quality of our daily experience and the depth of our relationship once again 
improved. This relationship continues to bring joy into all of our lives as we embrace this gift of mutual love more and more every day. Those of you who have been listening to our show for a while now know that it was our discussions around polyamory on this podcast that compelled my very own mother to label myself as evil and my wife as a slut. My brother told me, Eric, we have tolerated your psychedelic stuff, but this poly thing is just too much. And that was the last conversation in over two years that I've had with any of my family. At one time, they begged me to come home from Jamaica. (laughs) Soon after I did, we were tossed aside as sinful. (laughs) Ah, the sin of love. In April of 23, Sanctuary led its first camping retreat of the year. Susan, as you will hear in the episode, joined us. Susan has been a wonderful, beautiful, soulful part of Sanctuary since her return from her Jamaica retreat. And to my great surprise, on this retreat in April, Susan brought a healing to me that I could have never predicted. You will hear her talk about her embodiment of this Divine Mother on that retreat, but you won't hear her talk about how she held me as I wept, how she consoled me, how she forgave me, and embody that mother for us all who were present. We were standing around the campfire towards the end of the experience. There were veterans, psychedelic newbies, medical professionals, experienced psychonauts. As Susan shared her recount of the afternoon, her embodiment of this divine mother, I felt inspired to share my story of encountering this mother in 2009. As I related my experience, Susan became almost glowing. She thanked me for my story and said, the Divine Mother is still here. Instinctively, I stepped around the fire to the opposite side to give her a hug. Almost immediately, in my eyes, tears began to surface. Within a matter of moments, I was sobbing uncontrollably saying over and over, I just want my mama. It was the same phrase that repeated over and over during the onset of my last high-dose mushroom trip, but this time with Susan, I was not alone. I had a mother there to hold me, to comfort me, to tell me I was a good boy and that she was proud of me. Silence overtook the campsite, and my moans and wailings could be heard far and wide. Courtney, who was on the top of the tall hill above our campsite, heard it and knew it was my sobbing and watched the whole scene from afar. I was really grateful that she was a part of that. And as I was there with Susan, I just kept wishing that Courtney could be too. It's still unbelievable at times that after years and years and hundreds and hundreds of people, tens of thousands of hours supporting others in mushroom trips and integration circles, that this was honest to God the first time that I had ever felt equal support to that which I gave. I cried for a full 10 minutes at least. She held me the entire time with others standing around us in silence. She just kept saying in my ear, there, there, you're such a good boy. It was exactly what I needed. I have never, never felt so held and so accepted. And while I fully acknowledge and honor Susan for being the portal which allowed this healing to come through for me, we both know it was the Divine Mother that was present in her. I cannot thank you enough, Susan. I cannot express in words the gratitude that I feel for that moment. And that is why it is such an honor to share with you, our listeners, and with our sanctuary community, Susan's story. Susan's heart. 
please, everyone, all of us, let us not underestimate the power of our presence. Never undervalue what you contribute to the world through your compassion, through your inspiration. And never forget, we are watched over. We are cared for. We are protected by a divine, sacred presence of the goddess. And that if you will call out to her, she will respond. Won't you join me in welcoming Susan Slopter to Civil Seven Says? Susan with psilocybin, you have, uh, you're relatively, I mean, I don't know what's been a couple years now that you've been working with mushrooms. Uh, March 18, 2022 was my okay. first trip mm -hmm. and okay. that was in uh, Jamaica at Michael Meditations, which you guys birthed, <laughs> made happen, created for the world, dropped mm. into our world, and I thank you for that. And I know there's so many other people who thank you for that. Mm. That is just thank a huge you, thing that you've done. It really, every day I just think, wow, what have they done? They've just, <sighs> it's huge. <laughs> I yeah. think very often, what have I done? To yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a different way. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I still I still remember you reaching out to us before you even went on retreat and That's just right. letting us know that you were going and mm -hmm. that you intended to, you know, come back to our community afterwards um, for integration and just support you got good memory thank you for reminding me of that well that's some true. some things i remember and i remember <laughs> that <laughs> yeah that's true because when i found out about michael and i got your name eric up uh, your name was not part of that courtney at the time but mm -hmm. eric's name and i thought who is this guy i gotta find out who this guy is <laughs> and what's he doing now and so i found you on instagram and that's how it led me to this whole thing and um Oh, I know. Yeah. When I started, yeah. When I started looking into Myco and I started listening to um, the podcasts from there, mm -hmm. I forget the names mm -hmm. of those. And Still that totally Chronicles, yeah. Yes. And those stories that those people mm -hmm. told were so life enhancing and full of love. I. I knew that it was going to change the world then. Mm -hmm. And so that's been where I've been going ever since. And mm -hmm. so then I did go to Myco and I had three amazing experiences there. Um, my experience with the mushroom has been a curriculum mm -hmm. that the universe has put me on. They have me on a curriculum. They want to, they taught have taught me certain things that they want me to know. And I am a student and so, um, in preparation for this, I decided, you know, I was so thankful that we're doing this because it gave me a chance to sit down and really, really figure out what is really the role of the mushroom in my life and mm. what has it taught me. And so, I kind of wrote down some of the lessons, the curriculum that they, that in the lessons that I went through. Um, and I'd like to go through those because I think that would be helpful for your audience. Also... This is kind of like a little sidebar, but one thing that the mushroom did for me was, A, I got rid of chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, social anxiety, a really bad experience with my father. Um, so those are just the little things that the mushroom did for me, okay? That's why I went to the mushroom in the first place, because I had really severe chronic fatigue, and I had been on SSRIs, and nothing was working so that's what got me there in the first place. And, uh, and so all of those things happened, but that was just, that was just the universe's way of saying, we're going to snag you in here <laughs> so we can give you the real lessons. Mm. So, you know, just those five things, so those mental and physical health issues would have been more than I could have ever asked for in this life. Mm. More. And that is the tiny, tiny little bit of what the mushroom has given me. Mm. So, so how did you, <clears throat> before you 
start sharing these amazing lessons, um, <laughs> which I'm looking amazing. forward to hearing. <laughs> I'm sure others will uh, be able to feel it and appreciate it too. But um, how did you get opened up to the idea of communing with the mushroom, having the mushroom experience? Like how did that come across your, into your realm? Mm-hmm. I remember it very clearly. I was in a PhD program at Pacifica Graduate Institute in depth psychology. And we're studying, of course, the psychology of Carl Jung and the unconscious and so on. And there were some amazing professors there. These were professors who hung around with Stanislav Grof and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. right? These are professors that also work at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Mm-hmm. So as a when I retired in 2008, I treated myself to a trip that Pacifica was putting on with some of these professors to Italy, to Ascana, to visit the place that Carl Jung hung out at on Lake uh, Maggiore. And in one of those, and that alone was a magical experience, but I overheard a conversation that some of these professors were having, and they were discussing their experiences with ayahuasca. Now, this was back before they were telling the world that or that psychedelics was a major avenue into doing depth work. You know, we didn't have classes at Pacifica about uh, psychedelics. It was all a psychological framework. So I overheard them, and the word ayahuasca was in my head. Hmm. So I immediately went home and started looking that up, and then I found out that, oh, you can't be on SSRIs if you do ayahuasca. So I tried to get off and I could not get off. I could not get off. And I just realized, okay, that's not going to be for me. And I just put that aside. That was in 2008. And yeah, I just kind of put that aside. Life went on. And then I, I don't know how, maybe Michael Pollan's book, probably. Mm-hmm. Isn't, that, isn't that the book that hits us all? So, so anyway, so that's when I heard about that. And I started to look into my co and that's when I really decided I'm getting off these SSRIs because I want this and so I did the hard work for two months I struggled and I got off of my SSRIs for two months so I could go to Jamaica and but then when I came back from Jamaica my fatigue just hit me again so I went back on them until I started microdosing and then I really was able to get off of them so Mm. it has been kind of a Mm. I think but that's how I got there and of course that was the beginning of my real life. Were, just a quick question: were, were they requiring you to come off of? Were they requiring you to come off of the SSRIs to go down to Jamaica? I, um, I think so at that point, and now we know better. Well, now I we know, know that what, you didn't have to do. Well, I mean, when I was, but I think they I, were. Okay, yeah, I just I was just curious because when I was there running it, we never did that. I, I actually took quite a bit of heat yeah. for not requiring people to come off of SSRIs because we we knew it. We've known for decades, actually, through anecdotal, that it's completely safe with psilocybin. So, uh, either way, I'm glad you've been able to make that transition. Mm-hmm. So that's how I got there, you guys. It, I got there through depth psychology because uh, now we know that. Jung's concept of the self with a capital S is really God within us. Mm. Um, And he just couldn't say that because he was in a scientific community. But he himself had, his entire Red Book is about Mm -hmm. his experiences with the divine. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to ask if you could elaborate more on the spiritual side of this because, you know, as you've related a lot of your experiences, um, they're certainly, you know, psychological in nature, but there also seems to be a significant spiritual component to that. And I'm just curious how you kind of balance the two within your perspective around this work. Um, what drew me to uh, depth psychology was the understanding that symptoms are the universe trying to talk to us. The symptoms of depression, the symptoms of PTSD, all the things that you are struggling with in your life. Relationship problems, all of those are symptoms that are there to wake you up Mm. so that you start going inward and finding out what's going on. And when you go down that path, it leads you to one place, in my experience. It leads you 
to the sacred, to the divine, to the divine, to whatever it is that the spirit greater, something greater than yourself. And so I had an understanding of that. And the other one was my dreams. I really had a close relationship with what was happening in my dreams. I, my dreams were very meaningful to me. They were instructive. They, if <laughs> amazingly instructive, I would have a dream and I'd go, oh my goodness, there's there. What is this trying to tell me this through my dream? So I, and this was always the universe knocking, knocking, knocking on my door saying, hey, we're here. Look at this. Look at what we've done in your dream. We just gave you a master class. Where do you think this comes from? You know, and I still, I still didn't get it, but I was there. I was so ready, so ready. Um, and I also, very interestingly, a really important part of my story is that I come from a family of very de devout Christians on both my mother and father's side and going way back in both of my family history, they were devout Christians. And so I come from a family, we were raised in a religious, all of my friends, my family, everybody we socialized with were Christian reformed people. We went to church twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday. If we got away, we give on Wednesday morning for release time. We prayed before and after every meal. We read the Bible after every meal. I, this was the water in which I was raised in, mm -hmm. and I I can't say that I had any um, any trauma around that. It's just that at the age of thirteen, I had an experience, which we call now mystical, numinous. I was walking home from middle school. And all of a sudden, the world changed. The world opened up into this golden, intelligent, breathing reality. And I knew that I was being seen. And I was touched deeply. And I knew that what I was experiencing was, was what everyone thought was God. I mean, we... Our vocabulary is very poor with this, but <laughs> it's what my my church family thought was God, and it and I realized what I do at church, and what our family's talking about, is not this what I just experienced, mm -hmm. and what I want is to find this again, this experience again, and so my church life and everything just became immaterial to me. I could have cared less. I just followed along with it and did it all because it was what, you know, it's what our family did, and it was fine. Well, also I had another experience, which is important because I wanted, I really want to tell this story. When I was eight years old, I had a little brother who was four. His name was Jimmy, and I loved him dearly. I was daughter number three, and he was child number four. And he, I, I, my father was very stern, and I would stand up for my little brother against my father, and I loved him dearly. Well, he died at the age of four. He mm. was born with a congenital heart defect, and he was... And I remember screaming to my family, I hate God, I hate God, why would he take my little brother away? Which, when you're eight, doesn't really mean anything, and I don't remember hating God. Well, just my third experience with psilocybin in Jamaica, my little brother Jimmy came to me. Mm. He came to me as an adult, but he was still in his little boy body, but he was an intelligent being, and he came to me. And we sat on his grave, which still exists. Well, of course it exists. And we chatted and we played and we talked. And then he said to me, he said, Susan, God has sent me to fetch you back to him. Hmm. And that experience was more real than hmm. any reality I've ever had. Hmm. So he had come back to tell me that God wanted me back. And you, your experience with psilocybin, you understand what this means because these experiences are more real than anything real. So that was one of the experiences I had there. And indeed, that's what happened. Hmm. That's what happened. And I don't really care anymore what my what anybody calls a religious path i don't care all i know is that now i know 
Now I know that I am part of a world that pays attention to me, responds to me, cares about me, wants me to be full, fully myself, wants me to be the full expression mm. of myself in this world so that I can, sh I can shine back this love to everybody else. So now I'm back in the groove of my ancestors who knew this. My mother knew the love. She was, she knew the love. She was not a dogmatic person. She really felt the love of the universe. She felt this. And so now I just feel like I have joined the line of my ancestors, which is a big deal. Because I got that message too, that we are just in a lineage, you know, we think we're so important. And we are important, of course. But we're just another, another acorn in the tree. Mm -hmm. And this is where we come from, and this is who we are. So I now live in a universe that pays attention to me and responds to me. And I'm reading this because I wrote this before. And I live in a world that embraces me, guides me. A universe in which God, whatever word you want to use, is in me. And I am in God. And I am the same as God. I am a part of God. And one thing that I have learned is that I've been studying quantum physics and what that means in our world now, in the spiritual world. And what I've learned is that I, I like to see each day as a dream. What is showing up in my world, just like if it was a night dream? What is here? What is here teaching me something today? Who is this person? And what do they symbolize? Or who, what part of that is me? that's showing up in my world. And that has just made my life full of meaning. Hmm. And I know I've gone on and on, but that's kind of how it is. Hmm. <clears throat> that's beautiful. My little, brother, my little brother, Susan, I'm here to fetch you. God sent me. That is just as real as the fact that I'm sitting at a table in this library. It's more real. Can you talk about that reality a little bit? Mm -hmm. I mean, no. Well, it's a reality that isn't always visible, right? But it, we know it's there because of synchronicities, mm. because of intuition, because of feelings, what we feel, because all of a sudden... Everything has meaning in the world. Everything has meaning. And, you know, interestingly enough, I'm going to root back to Carl Jung because that's kind of where I'm from. He wrote a book called Memories, Dreams, Reflection, which is an autobiography of life. But when you read it, it's not about his degrees, where he went to school, who he married. It's about these experiences that I'm relating what was the dream he had? What experience did he have? That's his true autobiography. So for me, that's my reality as well. If I were to write an autobiography today, it would be of these experiences. Hmm. That is my true world. It is a reality now. Well, you guys know about it more than I do. You could probably speak about this reality. You are, this is your life. This is your life, this reality that we're now in which is such a gift, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I was, you know, I was wanting you to share more about that as well, because um, I know for those who haven't had that experience with the mushroom or another uh, entheogen like ayahuasca uh, or others, that when they hear a story like that you just told with your little brother coming to you and in, in the mushroom experience that they may think like we're he like sitting here right now that oh like this little boy just appears with their eyes and it's just <laughs> like this very you know straightforward communication in in this like envisioning it as if it's this reality that we're in right now like having this podcast right. when, when it in actuality isn't like that for for most people <laughs> i would say so i'm curious like for you um just to like how like how did you know you were speaking with your little brother 
Like, how, like, what was that? What was that? Like, how'd you know? Because it was him. It was him. It was him. Uh, it was more real than... Uh, well, here, here's how I knew. Because he knew things that only he would know. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's like... Um, how how would how who knew that this experience who knew to send this image of this little boy to me and to say to me susan god has sent me to fetch you where does that come from Mm -hmm. where does that where would that have come from that isn't something that my brain would make up that is far too intelligent it it came from somebody something some power that knew about my psyche, that knew about my life, that knew about my pains and my feelings. It came from something that knew me thoroughly. And it didn't come from from my brain, my brain. It, it didn't come from my brain. It was clearly something from outside of me, something transpersonal. Mm. And all of my experience has have been that they. It's like when you have a dream, and your dream addresses something personal to you. Your dream knows your psyche, knows you perfectly well, knows what your dreams are, knows what you're going to be doing tomorrow, and they want to tell you something about that. Mm-hmm. Where did that mm-hmm. come from? Mm-hmm. Where did that yeah. come from? That's clearly something. Yeah. There you go. I hope that helped. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, my, my phone keeps ringing over and over. I want to make sure it's not Theo's school. Or okay. <laughs> um, so for me, this is not. It's not been an easy to just accept that this is a reality that is behind our reality. But these, like you're saying, the information or the precognition that comes. Um, that like I, I've had at this point just far too many experiences where I was given knowledge of events that were going to happen before they happened or where another person even, not just a an entity, but another person outside of me in physical form communicating information to me that they couldn't have known. So yeah. I have to accept that that's coming from a higher yeah. intelligence. Um and, you know, this is the second time this week in conversation I've heard it said that the mushroom experience is more real than reality. The, I forgot who it was the other day said something about uh, ultra reality, right? Or ultra sober. That's what they said. It was like being <laughs> ultra, ultra sober, which mm-hmm. made all the sense in the world to me. And, you know, as, as this um, field of exploration continues to grow, I wonder what, how we can help um, folks like myself, particularly who are uh, very um, evidence-based, or you know, uh, I um, have a hard time with these more abstract ideas, or considering an alternative reality. Even how do we help people? become comfortable with with that reality so that can be embraced seeing hearing your experience and how you just you seem to embrace this other world already gives you that much more access to it when you go into the mushroom space and so i'd love to be able to help others just understand that that this is a reality and these are not just psychological aberrations and, you know, clutter from your subconscious that while that can happen for sure, but there is also very much the opportunity to connect with intelligences outside of ourselves, outside of physical form. Well, you know, there are books out there written by scientists who explore this. And one that I just read, um, I'm going to look it up right now here online because I'm not remembering it, but it's it's a book called The Metaphysics of Carl Jung. And this gentleman wrote a book about how that psychological world was actually speaking about a metaphysical world. Mm. And, and he referred me to a book 
by a guy whose last name is C-A-R-R-I-E-R, and I'll look it up, who wrote a book about the spiritual um, uh, meanings of quantum physics. And these are scientists who show experiments that cannot be explained, right? That show us that there is something, that there is more consciousness than what we experience in a daily world. So these are scientists. Um, I just have to get my Amazon account up here so I can figure out what that book was because that was enlightening. I just read that mm-hmm. last night. Oh. It, um, it's a yeah, small for those of you listening, if you become a sanctuary member, you'll have access to Susan's well, she's one of the leaders oh, yeah. of the book, book club. club. I forgot about Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Members only. Starting. Yeah, we, we haven't gotten. All right. I love Amazon. Here we have it. Yes, indeed. Here it is. Beautiful book. The Spiritual Implications of Quantum Physics. Reflections oh. on the Nature of Science, Reality, and Paradigm Shifts by Jeff Carrera, C-A-R-R-E-I-R-A. And that little book would be vital for all the scientists and materialists among our group to okay. try and move toward that, that little segue into the spiritual world. Because quantum physics now points to that consciousness has always been here, mm-hmm. that we have live in consciousness, and that it just didn't come... Consciousness just not did not arrive just when our brains became more developed, right? <laughs> Consciousness did not show up when humans evolved <laughs> into these thinking beings. It's always been here. Mm-hmm. It's always been here. And so that's kind of what this, this quantum physics with we create our reality, everything is a wave moving forward and backward, really will help scientists move into this new world of, I think, I love what you said about uh, kind of the, this being another dream that, you know, both realities are really equally valid and that we can wake up in either dream and realize that it is in fact a dream, that it's malleable much more right. or less than we suspect. So, you know, part of this, part of this ongoing thread of the supernatural um, I find related in when individuals come together. So you, you mentioned synchronicities earlier uh, as kind of an indicator of this other world. And I agree. And I, I very much consider, um, you know, our meeting as a part of that for myself uh, on the camping retreat, I shared, you know, that story of this, um, divine mother coming to me um, years ago. And as you related your experience that day, it was like, I just saw all of these puzzle pieces coming together. Just, it was, it was overwhelming. Just, just seeing all of this come together and, and kind of experiencing that role, that place that you play in that. And I have a feeling <clears throat> that this experience of this um, resurgence of uh, divine feminine, if we if we want to call it that, uh, is not just for me alone. That this is a collective phenomenon, a collective awakening that we're experiencing. And I'm wondering how much you would like to talk about that. Um, maybe relating it to your experience there at the camp or camping retreat or um, just kind of even, even, you know, Susan and I had a conversation before you went to Jamaica. We did, we had a phone call and part of our conversation was that, that psychedelics um, potentially having this um, feminizing or, or balancing role to play. And yeah, I, I don't really know how to enter into that, topic but i feel i know that it's a very important one so what what can you share Um, well uh, we are there we're moving there the feminine is must become active in our world it is becoming active in our world i think about 
your you guys and how much of that you're bringing into the world Courtney with your circles that are just when I the little bit I hear about them are just fantastic and the empowering mm -hmm. that you are doing for the women that are in your group is just I mean that will just grow and grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of thing. I, I'm, it's interesting to me how the feminine, there's a book that somebody wrote about all, um, uh, all his LSD trips. He was a scientist who did these many, many, many LSD trips, and the book is all about his experiences. And mm -hmm. at the very end, the very last things that he did, he met the Divine Mother. And mm -hmm. that what was behind it all was a feminine presence, a mm -hmm. feminine presence. And of course, I love that. Um, but of course, the idea is, is that there are no opposites anymore. The feminine and the masculine must blend into one. Mm -hmm. They must blend. And there, it's out of balance now, so that's why the feminine is coming. And it is coming. I see it everywhere around me. And we need to work toward that so much because, you know, the, the masculine has just been so ingrained in our world. I mean, it's just, it's been, and we're just beginning to know how to work out of that. What my experience with the feminine was very clear to me. Um, on my third trip in Jamaica, I was told, you know, I listen. I listen to these powers. You come from a line of people who knew this, <laughs> who knew about the love of God. You know it. And you have to get to work. You have to get to work. This is the rest of your life. Susan, you must do this work. You know how to do this work. You've been prepared for this work. You come by it genetically through your family. So you get on board, kiddo, mm -hmm. and do this work. Okay. So, And they also said, you know, we're going to give you the skills that you need. We're going to give you the confidence, the courage, whatever you need, we're going to give it to you. You know, and, and here, this woman just gave me these gifts in the experience. She said, I'm leaving you these gifts here. You pick these gifts up and you use these gifts. So I took that as being a pretty real, you know, job description. You get out there and do it, okay? And then I was shown this world in which the feminine was the powerful, where these feminine images were sitting on thrones. My mother was there. Um, I had a really fun experience where God came and sat and talked to me, and I said, well, where is your, where's the female God? And she said, and he said, well, I, you know, where does this come from? And he said, well, she's out doing all of the work now. Hmm. She's the one who's doing all the work now. And that seemed to me to be pretty important. Well, then on one of my last trips, I was visited by Kali, who's a Hindu goddess, the divine mother of the Hindu pantheon. And she said to me, she said, you must learn to love yourself completely. I'm not telling you this, Susan, because it'll make your life better. This is your job. And, and, mm -hmm. and it was me, but it was, of course, all women. You must love yourself with a ferocity so that you can do this work. Because it's only if you love yourself and don't get side-swiped by all the little, oh, I'm not good enough, and, you know, those things that we have in our head, that you can do this work. So she said, and I'm going to always be here beside you. Always beside you doing this work with you. And she was a presence, Kali, just like she's sitting here. So then, that you know, that just blew my mind. So then, the next experience I had was, she just came back to me and she said, okay, here I am, but now you are me, Susan. You are the divine. And, and of course, this isn't, this isn't, you know, inflation. This isn't that I'm a god. This just means that it was, she wanted me to know that this power is within each of us, and we are in it. We're in it, and it's in us. Mm. It's just everywhere. Mm. So what? that seems to me to be a pretty clear curriculum for what I'm to do in this world. So I live in a small rural part of New Mexico, and there aren't... So when I came back, I wanted to find 
make a community. And I have now got three other women with me. And there are two men that are going to be part of our group, that are part of the church now, that are, are nearby. And, um, and I can't even believe it, you guys, because this is not something that this human being could ever have done before. <laughs> this is, I am just a 69-year-old woman who, with all kinds of mental, you know, whatever. But anyway, I am on, this is all something that's working through me. And Eric, and you guys know this, you do this all the time. You do this all the time. You, you've given yourself up to this work, and, and it moves through you. That's what you do. You're only able to do the things you do because you are working hand-in-hand hand with this something else. Mm. And so I'm just letting myself do it, and so miracles are happening. Um, miracles are happening because I'm doing what I meant was meant to do here uh, in this world. And I know that sounds incredibly weird, but it happens. It happened to you, and it happened to me, and it happens. Absolutely. That is it. And, and it. You know, I don't want to kind of create this polarization. I completely agree with you that they, that we're moving towards balance. But doesn't it, to me anyway, it seems that the the imbalance that we have been currently under for so long is what um, propels the vast majority of humans into work that they don't want meaning meaningless work or lives that are you know kind of focused on a future rather than the moment not embracing that intuitive sense of what we are i i, I have no doubt that every single human being that comes into this earth has some kind of inspired direction to their life and the current system that we are working with here because of its imbalance is trying is, is like just naturally just pushes people into roles that aren't best suited for them in order to keep this machine going. But if we were to live that organic life, that intuitive life following our inspiration, that we would encounter miracles on a daily basis. You know, this, this, extreme rationality that you've you know you got to go to school and then university and then work your way up the ladder and you know all of this stuff is i feel like in direct opposition to our natural spirits and what you're saying is not uh does not sound flaky doesn't sound out there it sounds like what we need to come back to as a people we have forgotten in so many ways for thousands of years Interestingly enough, through religion, we have forgotten that we are naturally inspired, that we are the divine, as you've been saying. Mm -hmm. Eric, that is just so exactly right on. Uh, so uh, it is exactly right. And I think, I think of the work of Joseph Campbell in the 80s. Remember his uh, mm -hmm. the, the mask? That was... That was kind of the beginning into our culture of this message of the divine follow your bliss mm -hmm, mm -hmm. follow your bliss that is the bottom line follow your intuition so how many of us i did this when i was working a job just to make money we're so wounded so we make decisions based on trying to protect ourselves from pain for me mm -hmm. my because i was raised with a father who was very cruel to my mother I learned I will never, ever have to live with a man I don't want to live with. So that meant money. That meant I had to be financially. So I worked in a job that was ill-suited for me for 35 years, and I would be depressed, and I got chronic fatigue, and I just thought, ah, those are just nuisances. When they were there to tell me, you're on the <laughs> wrong path. Listen, you're on the wrong path. But I just thought, oh, what's really important to me is making this money so that I never, ever have to live with a man that I don't like. And that was a wound. That was a life lived based on this wound. And we are all wounded. We're all wounded. And so we learn to protect ourselves. And we don't, and the whole idea, you know, Joseph Hill say, follow your bliss. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice if you're not raising children and you don't have mouths to feed. You know, how many of us just, 
you, you have to go to work every day because you have to feed your children. It's a luxury to be able to follow your bliss in this world. It's a luxury to do that. That's why when you're retired, life all of a sudden opens up because you have the time to do these things. <clears throat> but, but now we are, this is like those circles that you have. There's probably working women in those circles, Courtney, with children. And they have all the same things that they have to balance the realities of this world. But they're learning to do it in another way. They're mm-hmm. learning to do it in another way. And we have members in our church who are stuck in horrible jobs that tear them down every day. But they're listening. They're seeing role models that are mm-hmm. telling them. You don't have to do it that way. Listen, listen. They're mm-hmm. learning. So that's the power yeah, of our church. Yeah, it's such a good point. It's not the power of our church. like... <sighs> And what you said earlier about your experience with um, Kali showing up and reminding you, like, you have to love yourself in order to do the work. And we hear that all the time, like in in self-development communities, um, you got to love yourself first. And even on a, the recent camping retreat, I was sitting with someone who uh, got really upset. You know, this person was like repeating, like, you know, Oh, I'm so mad. People keep telling me to love myself. Like I'm so sick of hearing that shit. And I get it. Like I get it because it's not that like linear. It's not like we can hear it and then immediately apply it all the time. There's all these experiences and phases of like learning to like open up and trust the process and feel that we're one with the process Mm -hmm. in order to love ourselves through all these different types of circumstances through our wounds here and here and here and here and until we've like completed a loop of feeling that love um, in our lives. And so, yeah, it's, it's so Mm -hmm. not linear and like following our bliss, you know, it it can sound really flaky to a lot of people, but it's not, it's at its core, at its core, really. It's, it's like, um, it's deeper than just like, I'm just going to do whatever feels good in the moment. Like, that's not <laughs> exactly yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be challenges that come up when you follow your bliss. I mean, mm-hmm. we, I, you know, we, but even myself back starting in 09 when I started the farm, you know, so many challenges and so many times where I just thought money was running out and, you know, and all that. And, um, but miracles come every, every single time, every single time that I have thought, you know, it's over. There's nowhere to go. The gig is up here. I went following my bliss. And I, you know, lost it all. My children are going to starve and something would happen. And so my question, I guess, is that, you know, what you're saying, Susan, is so accurate that we have you know, mothers and fathers and people who are in jobs and work that they don't love, they don't want, that's not their bliss. And they can't, you can't just jump out of the boat, you know, but <clears throat> there's two kind of two threads to this. First of all, you can start moving towards your bliss and be working and doing this other work that maybe supports things for the time being. That's certainly how I, you know, got going with the farm and all that stuff. You have to kind of sometimes balance that bliss with responsibilities. And the more you continue to choose to follow that bliss, then the bigger portion of your life that's able to occupy. But even more so, if we to if we educate our children from very early on to follow that intuitive sense internally, then they will be much less likely to set themselves on a course of, you know, trying to chase the dollar or get get the reliable job with the 401k and the depression and anxiety <laughs> that comes with uh, that's so true that's 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 so true you know but i think of i think you know if i if i were to go back i it's all about paying attention mm. you know if i would have paid attention to my depression mm. if i would have listened to that depression and gone deep. Well, I did. I went to counselors. I did everything. Um, but even within going to a dead end, horrible, life crushing job, if you see that experience as something as meaningful 
that that this experience has meaning for me. What is this mm-hmm. experience telling me? What is this experience telling me? And look at it like if it showed up in a dream, like if you had a dream that you were at a, a dead end job, and it was, every day you went to that job, and it was you were crushed by the people working there, and you woke up the next morning, you started thinking about that dream. What was that dream telling you? Mm-hmm. And if you look at your everyday world like it's a dream, and you pay attention. You know, it, my experience is that the divine just wants you to look at it, and then it will look at you, and it will yeah. guide you. You know, it's just, it's there. You know, we're in it. It just wants to be acknowledged. And if you start paying attention, it's going to come to you. It's going to say, hey, yeah, I'm here. You know, uh, that's been my experience. It just yes. wants to be acknowledged yes. in whatever mm-hmm. way you do it. Yeah, like I'm in this dead-end wow. job. My God, I can't even stand it. What is this about? Why am I in this dead end job? But it's hard because our lives are so busy. You know, it's hard. And we know, we know there are things that can help us. Getting up and doing yoga every morning is the is if we can do ten minutes of yoga on YouTube, there's these ten minute morning stretches, just ten minutes, you get on that mat and it will change what your day is like mm-hmm. for you. Mm-hmm. We, know, we, we, we know, we know we have these things available to us and those are the things. But I know, I know how busy life is and how, how hard it is. And well, It know. takes a community too. You know what Courtney was saying about the person on retreat who is like having a hard time loving themselves. It's like, how do you love yourself when you've hated yourself for so long? You, you're not just gonna shift right. gears. So having community yeah. around that can say, can show you through their example, can inspire you through words, and can see it in you to, to help nurture it and bring it out. It's, it's so crucial. Mm-hmm. That's exactly yeah. right. You, we can't do it alone. That's exactly right. I'm so glad you brought that up because, you know, huh, yeah, I mean, the community, there's so much work to do. And it's not that you do it on your own. You turn and you take the hand of the person next to you. Mm-hmm. and the person next to you, and then you can do so much more. Mm-hmm. That that came to me in a service service trip. I, it was a, <laughs> I learned that one of our jobs here is to be of service, right? And I, mm. I was communing with a dog at this time. I was, there was a dog in this, in where I was tripping, and this dog had issues, and I think you guys have heard the story, was could not breathe, and I'm, I'm talking to this dog, and I say, you, okay, you're showing me the suffering of the world. How can I, as one person, do anything against the suffering of the world? And the dog said, you don't do it alone. You take the hand of the person next to you, and together as a community, you do it. Mm. You don't do it alone. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that's how we do everything. You know, everything we can do in a community. Like, I mean, I think about the people in our community with huge issues, huge difficulties in life. But I also see how it's lightening up for them when there are people around them saying, you are beautiful, Mm -hmm. you are on the right path, you have a gift. And that's what we're here for, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're here for. So thank you guys for creating this community. It's so huge what you guys have done. It is just enormously important. Mm, and thank you. Yeah, we're we're happy, playing happy our role. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and I mean, I guess I keep coming back to it's it's happening through us. It's mm-hmm. this is not something. Yeah. While we that's right. we pretend that we made the decision to do the thing, you know. <laughs> um, but she, you know, it's really interesting. I'm gonna I'll, a a, uh, a gentleman who came on retreat in Jamaica years ago, uh, who's still a, a pretty good friend. He came here and saw me from Washington D.C. a few months ago. Um, he, in his mushroom trips, he came out of them from that point forward was calling God she and was saying how she is this she. And so I've been kind of taken on that perspective as well. And I don't know why that even came to my mind. It's just part of this ongoing kind of exposure, this revelation of this this mother, this this feminine coming into our lives. And so... I am more and more acknowledging that what we're seeing through sanctuary and all the stuff that we've done, it is her operating yeah. through us. Yes. You know, and, yes. I agree. She sees oh. the needs of the world and she knows that she has to be present. She's, I mean, her, <laughs> her world, her beautiful world that we're destroying. She's here for a reason. And I also think that's why psilocybin has entered the culture again. It's her medicine. It's her medicine. It's how she is speaking to us. 
I think I think all of these things have meaning. You know, why why all of a sudden in the beginning of the 21st century is psilocybin coming back on the scene? There is a reason. Mm-hmm. And it is and pure medicine. It's, it's been unstoppable as well. If you notice that, particularly the mushrooms, psychedelics generally, but the mushrooms in particular have this um, kind of below the radar, you know, even in the early drug war propaganda, you know, DMT and LSD were very, were really highlighted in this, you know, this message against um, psychedelics and psilocybin was to a certain extent. But if you go back and look at the old literature, psilocybin is rather absent in a lot of that. Um, It has, it has perpetuated in the underground unlike any other substance. I mean, it's easy to cultivate. It's, you know, there's a lot of aspects to it that make it such. And uh, it's just been very interesting to me that, yes, there, there is a, a divine presence behind the mushroom that will not be stopped. And it's just kind of funny. Like when you look back and you see like all this effort that we, that, that the, the man, <laughs> The system has gone through to suppress these medicines and the fact that they cannot be indicates to me that there is a force behind them uh, that is much much more powerful or much more expansive than we can recognize I, i'd love it if you could because i can't believe this conversation is already almost at an hour now um but if if you could kind of talk about you know how you have been how you've been doing the work that you're instructed to do Um, because it's only been, you know, a little bit over a year now and you have come so far in your practice uh, in building community virtually and even in your own physical space. Now, you know, uh, posture, John, who we just did a podcast with you and him have been organizing this retreat for sanctuary ministers, Mm -hmm. which you are now a minister and you've been working with, uh, you know, friends and loved ones in your area. C- can you talk about what that's like actually being of service to the mushroom as a minister of it? Mm-hmm. Well, it. I'll tell you what it's like physically. My heart feels like it's three sizes bigger. My heart is full, full of love, full of love and um, I just see everyone around me as somebody that I need to listen to so I'm a listener I listen to the people around me um, you know it it's hard to just even put that into words Eric because you know when you're doing the work that you're put here to do, it just happens. You know, um, there's a tarot card. I don't know which one it is, but there's a a woman on a white horse. And the meaning of that card is that the white horse is the power, the spirit that's going to lead you forward. And all you have to do is hold on to that white horse. Mm -hmm. The white horse is the power that's going to lead you through your life. And you're just riding on that horse and so you don't have to be the power. The, the power mm-hmm. is the force that goes mm-hmm. through you. Mm-hmm. And you are just there doing the work that comes up as you go, as you move through the world on this spirit horse. You know, it's going to take you where you're going to go. And all you have to do is be present. So I, it's hard for me to describe except that listening and looking closely at everybody in my world is what my life is now. You know, anybody who comes, man, I'm right there. I want to know why they're in my world. You know, why are you here today, mm-hmm. Mr. Oil Delivery Man? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> what, what, what's going on here? You know? End up in, it is wonderful. It's wonderful being you know, because all my life I couldn't be with people, and now I love being with people. And I, 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 it's. I wish I could put this in better words, but yeah, I, I'm a listener now, a listener, because I think that everything in my world is 
here to guide me and talk to me. And it's here for a reason. And I just have to know what that reason is. And I'm just riding that white horse. And that's where the power comes from. And I just have to let go, right? We just have to let go. Let go and mm -hmm. ride that damn horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that beautiful horse. Not a damn beautiful horse. Yeehaw. <laughs> power <laughs> forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Giddy up, cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, you know, I so appreciate being able to do this because, you know, just as we all know, you you become a better teacher. What is it? You, in order in order to learn how to be a good teacher, what is it? I don't know what it is. I'm I'm get, I'm mixing my metaphors. <laughs> but this this really allowed me to be able to speak more clearly about why I do this work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thank you so much because I've been thinking about it and you know where, you know. All these little bits and pieces, like one of the first things I was going to talk about was, you know, the four-legged stool that you have to have underneath you in order to live a good life. And that's, that's heart, the four H's, health, um, head, heart, hands, and home. And if you don't have all of those well-balanced home being spirit, you know, it's 4-H, you can't <laughs> live a good life. And then I realized, yeah, that's right. But then you become that stool. You're the stool itself. With the stool itself. I, I mean, I think that, ah, uh, I just feel so grateful. <laughs> I feel so grateful because I, I, I'm here doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I know that my, my relatives are looking down at me and they're, I, I know they're intervening for me because they're saying my daughter is doing the work I'm supposed to be doing. You help her do that work. So I feel like I'm stood by my ancestors, my relatives, my family. And that's such a deep and powerful, wonderful thing to feel. Mm. Yeah. So thank you, yeah. guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you for for practicing that letting go. Um, as you were talking about that, um, I was feeling like our own process of letting go um, in different areas of our life, but specifically with sanctuary. And, uh, you know, we've spoken about sacrament services and that's been a whole evolution for, for us as an organization since we started. Um, and, you know, rethinking like how can we open up access uh, more and more and more safely uh, and with support and feel good about it as we open up access to sacrament more and more and building trust with our community is such a big part of that. And you um, just continuing to show up uh, along with like John uh, Clark, as Eric mentioned, and Julie, who we also recently interviewed um, and others. Um, I'm just, I'm so grateful for you all, um, our entire community, um, but those who really show up for each other and um, you all starting this, this uh, trying out this new model of ministers coming together and friends and family ministers and myself ministers and, you know, holding space um, and making that more accessible, like the most, maybe the most accessible has been yet is just, uh, it's definitely been a process of letting go uh, for us, um, but but we're able to do that with people who who show up uh, like yourselves and show up for each other. So thank well, you for so helping important. us let go. Oh, thank you for saying that. You know, it's just going to be happening. You know what what mm -hmm. John and Julie and I are do are doing is. <laughs> It's just, we, it couldn't not happen. And it's, mm -hmm. and more things like that are just going to happen and happen and happen mm -hmm. and happen and happen. And, um, you know, I really need to acknowledge that this tree that is growing comes from very strong and healthy roots that you have planted. It comes from a very strong intelligence. The ethics of the church, the the boundaries of the church are there for a reason because this is powerful, strong medicine. And without that, those, that scaffolding that you have provided, we would not be able to, to be moving our energies in such a 
a way that makes mm. such an impact. So I and, and I just want to say that you know, you have provided with us a strong root structure to do this. And, you know, whatever comes of this is always going to be strong because you have planted and you have are showing us and supporting this tree. So your work, anybody who's listening to this, if you go to sanctuary.com and start reading the material that, that you guys have written, will be very, very impressed with loving kindness behind us with the respect of us, with the understanding that we are human and fallible this work so i just it's important to mm -hmm. me that you understand how powerful your work is mm -hmm. and what you have done because it's going to take off and it's going to take off but we come from that place of integrity so thank you mm -hmm. wow oh, thank you mm -hmm. It's uh, as you say that I reflect on how much, you know, Courtney and I's relationship <clears throat> is kind of built into that foundation, even if it's not seen. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's for years prior to the organization forming and the courageous, honest conversations that she and I have had, the personal work and collective work that we have done. Um, I'm not sure that we even recognize really how much of a a role that that plays in in the the root structure of this organization. So I, I really appreciate that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a great deal. And there's been so many people. I mean, the work that we did in Jamaica, um, you know, Sanctuary has been so informed by the lessons mm -hmm. that we've learned <laughs> there with the help of so many brave people, so many courageous people who, mm. you know, took a leap and came to Jamaica and <laughs> like, I mean, the courage that that takes, like, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. it's a lot. And so I'm, I'm just so grateful for everybody. Yeah. I mean, you say and Julie, you know, there's a lot of people who have mm -hmm. been a part of our personal community and mm -hmm. seeing that expand. And, you know, again, so much of it just comes back to community and recognizing that, Yes, the sacrament, the medicine, however we label it, is really powerful, but it's only as powerful as we engage with the process, which is mm -hmm. always a communal process. The mushroom is always showing us that we are each other. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't include that component, then mm -hmm. we're missing a huge portion. Mm -hmm. Psilocybin is something that you almost can't learn. I mean, you, I don't know how much of anything in life you actually learn through reading instructions, right? You don't like, you didn't learn to drive by reading the driver's manual. You learn to drive by getting out there and being scared and being cautious and, yep. you know, follow, right. follow, following the basic rules, which is, you know, what we try, uh, I've tried to provide in these is the kind of the basic framework, basic rules or basic functions of mushroom space so that people can feel confident enough to dose themselves first and foremost, and then start moving that out to friends and family and then to the wider community in Jamaica or not, not like, like we did in Jamaica <laughs> where you had these like you had these larger, it's all muddled uh, where you have these larger groups that, you know, you have support people who are specified taking care of the larger group. And so, yeah, I'm, uh, hey, Eric. It's going to be how interesting to see how this all develops. Hmm? How about videos showing videos. different sitting vid training sitters? Like, here's mm -hmm. an here's what could happen in a, when you're sitting with somebody. Here's what you should do if they come up for air and they start talking about, yeah. oh, gosh, you know, I this is what happened. And it's very compelling for them. It's very compelling. And mm -hmm. they, they want to talk about it. And you... And and what what do as a sitter and that's in that thing you know what hmm. as a sitter could you do and you know just have little trains of here's the here's yeah, the like sitting thing yeah you know here's well, here's one like, way to do it yeah I like what we've um, updated with the friends and family ministership program where we have these challenges now um, where it's like it's an optional thing where um, like I think this this is, is it next week where um, there's this practice of like going out, like scheduling a date with a friend 
uh, for a couple hours and with the intention of being a space holder for them and practice active listening and practice the, the mirroring oh. that you're talking about. Uh, and obviously it's not the same <laughs> as being in the mushroom mm-hmm. space, but um you know, just that practice and then coming back to those weekly calls uh, to talk about the experience. I mean, what just just going like you mentioned privilege, you know, going to Jamaica and having that experience. And, you know, I think we can any any one of us uh, in all kinds of areas can live in this bubble where it's like we forget how privileged we are in certain circumstances and the privilege that sanctuary and other faith-based organizations have to to even provide access to the mushroom for our members is just so it's just so huge i mean i look at uh, oregon you know oregon health authority and the training protocols that they've come up with you know they don't they cannot legally require those that they give licenses to to administer mushrooms they can't require them to to gain experience with the mushroom, mm-hmm. so they they end up you know graduating with all this book book learning, but but no actual experience and just getting sent out <laughs> into the to the world to hold space with no experience ever required, mm-hmm. just experience with like breath work and ketamine, and so you know I I'm really excited to see how as we grow and as we build trust and like have minister retreats like what you you mm-hmm. and Julie and John and we're doing collaborating together to like let's practice um developing this model where we can get more experience mm-hmm. with like real time experience which is like totally what you're saying is totally where it's at that's where it comes to yeah I mean, even like this I'm thinking about the the challenges and practices like this week's this week's um, tool and challenge was tools to um um heighten your sense of intuition your intuitive sense and like that's all well and good but until you're in the mushroom space where it is a necessity where you have to use your intuition if you're going to be a good facilitator then that's where the practice actually comes into play so you know what you all are doing out there with this you know low cost basically just the cost of all the it's very low cost from what I understand for what y'all are doing that's exactly where the direction that we hope this goes in so that once once this book learning has been done then now you who have rapport and trust with each other can come together and work on this experiential learning and it, it relates back to that metaphor that you were uh, uh, trying to share with us, I think which is you know basically like a good student is also a good teacher and right. vice versa right <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, I love the idea of, the, of like a video module because that's something I've been trying to think of. There are, there's so many quirky, weird, nuanced forms of engagement within the mushroom space that are difficult, if not impossible to articulate, uh, in written literature. And even to, you know, if we were to do video examples of, like you're saying, someone coming out too soon, there are you know, a million different ways that that could go, but having that visual and having that, um, just kind of that touch point, but it's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say whose name it is, but if you're listening, this is a little (laughs) wink at you. One of the facilitators that we trained with sanctuary early on, like it's very blatant, like no phones in mushroom space. Right. And she came out and she's like, I gotta tell you, Eric, I'm sorry. I found myself scrolling on my phone during the during the service, you know, when I, when I was trip sitting, I was like, I see, you can't learn, you don't <laughs> learn from written, you don't learn from written material, you learn from the experience. You bring your phone out in the middle of a session, and you're like, oh my god, this is not right. What am I doing? Yeah, <laughs> and, and the the personal experience with the mushroom, like actually mm. communing, and the experience holding space with you know, others that can give you support. It's like both of those, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard to know until you're in it. And then you like see someone pull out their phone. And you're like, oh. yeah, well, can, like, can you, yeah, compare that's Susan? exactly right. You go, Oh no, you know, but you can't do anything <laughs> there. You know, no, I learned so much from watching um, the Stanislav Grof um, video uh, documentary uh, mm-hmm. psychonaut because in there, sitting with patients uh, in some clinical, you know, the, 
the people have given him. And one of them is where he's sitting having a horrible trip. You know, she's going, she, all the demons of hell are coming out through her. And, you know, mm. saying horrible things to the sitters. And Stanislav Grof, and it's how he can, how he interacts with that person, which is worth, you know, is worth so much in learning about what to do if that should ever be your, what happens to you in a sitting situation. He just says to her, you know, what is it that you need? Just as you've taught us. What is it that you need? What do you need here? How can we help you? And immediately that hatred fell away mm. into, ah, somebody sees me. They hear my pain. They want to know what my pain is. And little vignette was so instructive mm. about mm. if you could ever meet something like that. And that is something probably in the public domain that you could share, that you could show. Um, and I okay. think there were some other uh, videos of, of, um, of him sitting with other people. That was, you know, cause, because he's the, he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? He's yeah, he's the LSD, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So maybe and you and this need is not to, like, film, film ourselves <laughs> in the mushroom you guys, space. Yeah, cut there you the go. You, you would be great. You could just, we would have a lot of fun with that. You could have a lot of fun. <laughs> and you know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> When I when I have somebody sitting with me who's not, I had one. I have a friend who doesn't know anything about this who sat with me once because she was the only person I could find to do it. And I just said, "Hey, if I if at about an hour and a half or something, I come out and I start, you know, telling you about all this wonderful stuff that I'm learning, please say to me, Susan, you have told me that if you come out of this and you start talking, that I'm supposed to tell you that there's a lot more inside there for you to get. So just go back under for a little while. So I give people instructions that that's what they're supposed to do." Because it is so wonderful. You come out and you want to talk to people and you want to mm. share with them and you want to be in this love bubble, you know, that's just so much fun and so wonderful. And, um, but you know, what I found out at the, at the Kentucky thing is that that love bubble goes, lasts a long time. So you can mm. stay in the mushroom space for, you know, six, eight hours and still come out and be in the love bubble. Cause that love bubble is a great place to be. Mm -hmm. That's just mm -hmm. a wonderful place to be, but anyway mm, thank you, you so guys. much susan like yeah, yeah this conversation has been so good and mm -hmm. um just oh, yeah full of in the love bubble i feel like we've been <laughs> speaking <laughs> of love bubble. Love bubble. So, isn't that a great place to be <laughs> we I always remember. ask what, oh, <laughs> yeah. what do you remember oh somebody in the church called it the fire hose of love <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> psychedelics oh, are the yeah. fire hose of love I, and I'll never forget that. I love that. That's you know, beautiful. What could beautiful. be better than that? All right. Well, before before we roll out of here, Susan, leave leave us on a high note. What does psilocybin say to you? Psilocybin saves lives. Mm. Yes, it does. It saves lives in so many ways. It saves our real life. It brings us back. It gives us ourselves back. Mm. Psilocybin give, helps us incarnate our own selves. We mm. incarnate who we are truly meant to be here, who we really are, which is beings of love and joy. That's it. That's mm. that's what we're trying to get to, right? That's who we yeah. are. Amen. Amen. I love it. Oh, so thank are you. you. Thank you so uh, much. Yes, this has been awesome.